other Wednesday under Tinta Talks to discuss. So as a reminder, Tinto Talks is a dev diary for a game that is not released yet and has a code name Project Caesar. But we all know by now that it is surely EU5. Last week I was showing you the sources of income and how you can spend it. So generally about the balance of your economy. So we focus on even more interesting stuff, including loans, tax in a province, as well as trade goods. If you want to watch any of my past videos on Tinto Talks, you have a playlist link in video description. But yeah, before I even jump into the latest uh, the diary, I want to see the map. Ah, ah, so this time we are presented with an Indonesian island of Java, Java, however it is pronounced. I know it very well, I've played too much of Majapahit lately, there's Banten here, right, there's the Strait with Sumatra, there are many more provinces here compared to you for right? Some more like locations. But yeah, let's start with loans and bankruptcy. Because based on what Johan is telling us here, it's gonna work a tiny bit different compared to previous grand strategy games, especially U4. In U4 you had a loan cap, you had the loan size, and you had interest. Right? And based on all of this, you had you could take some amount of money from a national bank, pretty much, right? In case of U5, some stuff will be similar. There will be amount of money you can borrow, and there will be size of the loans, and there will be their interest. But in this case, you'll not be borrowing money from imaginary national bank, but instead, you'll be able to take your money either from estates or diplomatically from the other countries. As for the money from estates, part of the money that they're making the, from the provinces and locations will be saved for their own treasury. That treasury will be spent on different stuff like investments, but some part of it will be also saved for the country available as loans. So for example, here you see that estates are making available for you 696 ducats possible to loan at an interest rate of 10% and each loan will be sized 23 gold. So this is very important because uh, the more rich your estates are, I assume, so the less tax they have, the more money they are potentially are able to borrow to you. And also, here it is very important that if you don't, do not have any more money to be taken from the estates or your estates are super poor and you don't have many loans to take, you just go bankrupt without money. Unless you reach out diplomatically to some countries abroad. And they are mentioned here that there will be banking countries like Peruzzi or Bardi that, if they're within your diplomatic range, will be able to give you a loan. But you have to be very cautious because if you do not repay it, they'll never give you a loan again. And, uh, you know, in EU4 it was a bit different. I mean, uh, the country was just getting a casus belli on you and usually it was too tiny to enforce on you giving the money back. We're having a first look how the menu tooltip for a specific location will look like. You see from the top this is a location of Kalmar that is part of the province Ostrasmaland and is owned by Sweden. We have some information like amount of the population, what is the raw material being produced, so it's not a trade good like in Euphor but raw material instead, what is dominant religion, dominant culture, it's also different to U4, right? In U4, it was just a culture or religion of a province. Right now, we have a dominant because different pops might have different religions and cultures. Then we have a tax base, a market. So again, I'm more than sure that the trade nodes, markets in this case, will be dynamic. So one province might be under Riga market or it would change to be a part of, I don't know, let's say, never market, right? We'll see about that. There is food production, as it's negative, and then climate, topographic, vegetation. So something that we had mentioned in a second Tinder Talks. So how about food? It will be some kind of a balance like with economy, where there will be a calculation of how much food you produce in a province. And from the top, again, you produce eight food, 5,000 from peasants or slaves. So these two estates are responsible for producing food for you. Then you have some modifiers that are impacting that percentage-wise, like the climates, is it a town, is it coastal, and some reforms that you are having. My finally, we have food consumption, 
that is consumed obviously by each of the estates depending on their quantity. So you see, in this case, there are very little nobles and colleagues, but a lot of burgers and peasants that are using the food. Now the question is, are all the estates consuming the same amount of the food? Or, for example, nobles are consuming two or three times more than a peasant, which would be a bit more historical, right? Now you have information how trade of the food is working. If the granaries of Austria Strand are close to full, we would sell their surplus to the local market in Riga, but only get about 56% of the profit because that's our controlling karma. So that's another reason to have a high control in a province to actually get most of the money for supros from food. Because if you say it, let's say for one gold, you only get 0.56 of it if your control is on that level. If the entire province lacks food, we would have to buy food 100% in of the current price in that market. The price for food is different in each market and depends entirely on how much food is sold to that market. And I think I do like that it is handled by market and there's, it seems at least for now that there is no trade between the markets. At some level it is reasonable because the you know, in these times most of the food would just be damaged and not uh, possible to eat after months of travel, let's say, from Paris to Warsaw, right? But maybe I'm wrong and it would be a bit different, but I'm not against this kind of approach. Finally, we have taxes explained for one specific location. So you see, you have a few calculations here. Going from the top, right, we have the current tax base. 0.42 ducats, which is coming because of our 56% of the control. Then the second row is potential tax, 0.44, we should be at our max control that we can have of the province, because there's an equilibrium. And finally, if we had a maximum, maximum available control, which is not in our size right now, so at 100% we get 0.76 of base tax. But base tax does not work like in U4. It doesn't mean that I will earn that much of money. This is the maximum I would get out of the estates if they were all taxed at 100%. Right? So if you take a look right now, the tax base of each of the estates, if you combine them, you have our current tax base 0.42. So that's how much their tax base is. But then we have the tax rates for nobility, clergy, burghers, and the peasants. And you see that Depending on the tax rates, we are earning some amount of the tax. So in the end, out of 0.42 of possible tax, we're only earning 0.05 gold of tax, which is very little compared, right, to the base. So you see here, it is important to have a high control, a high tax base from the estates, and if you want to really earn a lot from the tax, we also need a high tax rate. And what's important, everything that does not go to tax, but stays with the estate, it goes to their poll. So they can invest it, and they can give some of it to your loans. Finally, you have some information about raw goods, raw materials. So as you notice in the tooltip above, we talk about raw materials and resource gathering operations. Every location has one raw material possible that can be extracted. This includes things like lumber, stone, grain, amber or copper. Of course, there are other ways to get access to raw materials than merely owning and controlling location. Like trade. Only peasants and slaves will work on gathering raw materials. Very important. And how many will work on it will depend on your infrastructure that we've built and the pops that are working on the raw materials are not producing food unless the raw materials is food. So we have an example here. We have, uh, you see that Kalma is producing one stone each month. It's because a thousand peasants and slaves are working on it. And then what we are producing is directly being sold to the market for 0.7 ducat of gold. We could upgrade the mines in Kalmar and see for each level of mine we'll get another thousand peasants and slaves working on it, up to 12,000 that is maximum. So we could increase the income from uh, stone from 0.7 ducat to like 8.4 ducats a month at the maximum level of the mine. And you also see that each level of mine costs us 44 gold and takes 180 days to upgrade. And this is something also very new. You're not only paying gold for the buildings, because in this case, the construction of mine also costs you lumber that you have to buy from the market. Now, that's a question. 
do you let's say you produce lumber in other provinces in other location from Sweden do you take this lumber directly from this other location or this lumber is being sold to Riga market and then from Riga market you're buying it in Kalmar that will be also reasonable but I assume there will be this kind of questions in the comment section to which I will jump in a second but yeah before I do that, next week we will talk about buildings more deeply. That is very important. Now, let's jump to the comment section. Team Detox? <laughs> Johan Talks. <laughs> I love the edit here. It is Wednesday, my dudes. I wonder what will trade look like in UFI. I hope it will not be based on static trade directions. It won't. That's what I'm telling you guys. I love taxing the peasantry who hoard all the money for themselves and giving tax exceptions to the poor people of my realm. Like the culture of the nobles. I don't see any drawbacks to the plan. We'll know more about the markets and how dynamic they are in two or three weeks. Are banking countries one for of landless countries you previously mentioned. Yes, so that's the new type of the countries that will be introduced in EU5. Oh, so are there only raw resources? No, we'll probably know more in the future about the other type of the resources that we'll be having. <laughs> Look at this UI from Imperator, from Victoria and from Tintotox. It's just place for UI. And honestly, Imperator is just the best. These two are shitty. The confirmation that if you don't have the specific good raw material to proceed with a building, it will just stall. The Medici Bank will have some unique mechanics. It is also a confirmation. It's a game rule that your subjects will have a same color as your country. Just like Eyalets in U4, or like the mentioning Victoria and Stellaris. And apparently in the later state of the game where there will be not much loans offered by the estates, there will just big families offering you loans. So just, I think this is again the kind of the countries that are not really a country. <laughs> yeah, again, cloth is not a raw material and we talked about next week because Lord Lambert, our friend, uh, was saying that it's it's not really an extracted good. It's a manufactured good. So we'll be talking more about this manufactured goods in the future Dev Diaries. Yeah, there will be also more discussion about the logistics because there are already good questions about occupying provinces of granaries. There are also some discussions you know, for the people saying that also the money that is being that is not being in base tax because of the law control is not staying neither in the state nor in the states. So where does it vanish? And so Johan is saying that it goes to the rebels pool. Oh yeah, and have comparison of the locations in U5. Again, thank you, Lola Lambert. Compared to current provinces in U4. But actually province-wise, we have more in U4. <laughs> we'll talk about them much later today. What do you mean much later? This is a good uh, question. Is there a way for one material provinces for projects here? I thought Victoria free multiple resources provinces were quite good. Well, but in Caesar we have a 10 to 50 locations for a single province from Victoria free. I also see a lot of discussions in this forum that people don't like that that amount of money, like the fact that the province is far away and you have low control means that neither estates or you are making money. And it looks like people are pushing away for it a lot. There are a lot of comments on this. So that might be something, uh, Mr. Johan, to reconsider how it works. Because, yeah, I, I don't understand the point being made by the public. It doesn't make sense that if the province is far away, most of the money just vanishes into rebels. Why estates cannot keep it? Or it's a, a bit different kind of the mechanic. I understand that if they are far away, they are not really your estates under your country, but this is. Uh, I understand how people don't like it. This is something, something that Johan is agreeing with. A province is zero countries like it's not part of the country, therefore, the estates of the province do not contribute to the country. Since the estate post is country level, it cannot get wealth from estates and that couldn't contribute. Basically, I imagine that uh, those estates are not controlled and not part of the country and will do their own things, potential rebels, that cannot be captured by the country's estate's wealth. I get it. As long as it's made very clear where this wealth goes, because it's a really great system that the estates have their own wealth. But if it doesn't go to estates from your country, it doesn't go to the crown, we have to know where it goes. 
So I'm, I'm hoping that it's just gonna be polished because it seems like it's uh, it's not clear yet. Would promises have capital locations? Yes, they will. Oh, yeah, we have one explanation. The rebel funding system. So uh, again, the question is about the the pool of the low control, right? The rebel funding system looks at this pool, but it's not a one-to-one -one transfer. So yeah, a lot of money just vanishes into the thin air if you do not have the control. Here's my thought. Right? You have local control of the province. So the locals are having much more money for themselves because you're not taxing them. Right? So they're building up these locations by themselves, getting their own buildings and making the, the these provinces and locations more rich. So over the time, we you increase your control of this province, you should profit from what these citizens build. Right? That would be a great system, but yeah, it sounds complex. Uh, let's see what they figure out in the future. That's what I'm talking. Someone is suggesting that it should be actually down to be more in depth, but Johan is saying that it could be designed, but the performance might be a problem, and I agree with that. The system might not be perfect, but it would be still much more interesting than what you have in U4 right now, with just the autonomy and estates not doing really much. We have an updated variant with Project Caesar, and Please to announce our brand new game, not Victoria 3. And the questions? Is not Victoria 3 code for Vicky 3? <laughs> look at this. I wonder what will trade look like in U5? Hot will not be based on static trade decisions. It won't. Johan, this is all well and good, but what is an U5? It's Project Caesar, isn't it? Oh, and Johan is confirming that they did try a system where the money did not disappear from the lack of control. And just said it made it far better just concurs and not build up the infrastructure. So just blobbing game. The courses of the game systems has been semi-playable since autumn 2020, and we have tested so many things so far. Yeah. We kind of have to trust on this decision. And uh, Johan, you're convincing me with every message that this is actually a fairly good decision. At least for now, because maybe in the future DLCs it could be you know. Revisited. This is interesting because we have first information about the peace deals. So are there any implications for of low control on the warfare? Yes, the cost of taking something in peace scales with their control. So the lower control we have of a province, the cheaper it is to be taken in the war. And there will be a Tinto Talks schedule that is called Winter. How many Tinto Talks you have scheduled, Johan? Uh, and this is about uh, weather. But yeah, this is it. I've read all 27 pages of comments and the hype is just not dropping, guys. And if you are also hyped for this game, you might leave a like on this video and subscribe to the channel to get notified about the future Tito Talks. And I will see you next Wednesday, Thursday. Bye!